Exciting things to come. Thank you so much, Johan. Well, let's move on to our first session now, and that is sustainable mobility. As we just heard, the self-driving vehicle is a major focus in future mobility. The other, of course, is the electric car. More and more automakers are moving away from combustion engines and are committing to going all electric. But the bottleneck here are still the battery packs regarding range and price. Will there be batteries that can take us anywhere? I have a panel of experts joining me now. Let me first introduce Dr. Maximilian Fichtner. He is the head of Celeste, a research platform on batteries at the University of Ulm and the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. A warm welcome to you. We also have Amy Boulanger with us. She is the executive director of IRMA. Now that stands for the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. It's great to have you both with us. Max, I'll start with you. Tell us about the direction that the development of battery packs for vehicles is going. Yeah, at the moment, a lot of things are going on. Basically, there are two directions. Um, so uh, one, thing which was maybe a game changer already last year was the development of the so-called cell to pack design um, this is um, this is a way of getting the material into the battery pack which uh, provides much more space for the active material so at the moment uh, a battery pack contains only 25 percent of active material and by this redesign of the interior you can actually um, get an increase of, of 15 to 20 percent or even more um, alone by design uh, without changing the chemistry and then there are a lot of other things um, i mean uh, there are upcoming engineering improvements uh, so the the companies want to uh, integrate uh, the cells um, into the chassis of the car this will give another boost of 30 to 40 percent and then there's a lot of things going on uh, on the chemistry side. Uh, at the moment, mainly the anode is redesigned, the, the negative pole, and um, by, by replacing the uh, graphite that has been used so far by uh, a mixture of graphite and silicon, uh, you can actually get a boost of another 30 to 40 percent. Then, together with some some improvements of the uh, um, cathode, we will achieve uh, uh, actually a great improvement. And this is a game changer uh, uh, because uh, the new designs, um, which allow much more space for the active material, um, gives us the room for uh, a much wider choice of materials. That means we can also choose materials which are much more sustainable, uh, which do not contain critical elements anymore. And uh, I think there's a kind of a twilight of materials going on. At the moment. Okay, so a broader choice, that sounds good. Amy, if you will give us an idea of the landscape regarding resources. Do we have enough cobalt and other minerals that are needed for lithium ion battery packs? Well, I'm, I'm watching Max laugh over there as well, because, of course, these are the questions that, you know, enough depends on a whole set of variables, right? From everything from are we going to take what we do right now with the individual car that's fossil fuel driven and expect to do the exact same thing, but we just think we're going to do it with cobalt or with lithium or something else, or are we looking at a completely new day? where, as your opening speaker talked about, are we doing transportation in a completely different way? Are we looking at equity globally in a different way? Um, are we looking at um, materials retrieval and recycling? I mean, certainly in this moment right now, um, our shift to move away from fossil fuels, which is absolutely necessary and which is creating a whole set of, of demands on new materials like lithium or cobalt is creating this massive new demand. But I think there are a whole uh, set of thinkers, whether they be thinkers like Max who are thinking about whole new ways to approach mobility and the materials we use to those who are asking us to think about our consumption levels 
or indigenous communities who live around the other materials that we're looking at, maybe this is a moment to think not only switching from one material to another, but looking at materials retrieval and recycling, reducing our consumption, reducing extraction, looking at whole new ways to move people around. So I'm not sure it's easy just to say, do we have enough? Because maybe we need a whole new way to look at what enough is. That's right. We need those disruptors that Hans mentioned earlier. So Max, let's talk range anxiety. The magic number that's often floated around is a thousand kilometers. When will we see batteries that can drive that length on one charge? Um, I just read a recent study that in Germany, uh, the customers would be happy with an average range of 470 kilometers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for me personally, I, I'm driving electric since five years. For, for me personally, um, the range is not um, the big issue. Yeah, I would say with with a, a range of 500, 600 kilometers and fast charging, I think this is the, the, the critical issue, um, um, we can get everywhere. Uh, but uh, to your question, uh, of course, this will be possible. Uh, I just mentioned in my first statement that the moment, uh, at the moment a couple of things are going on and this is a um, a, a vertical process. That means uh, the, the improvements are st can be stacked upon each other. So if we say the cell to pack design allows another 20 to 30 percent, and, and then we have anodes which much higher, with much higher capacity, which will allow another 30 to 40 percent, maybe cathodes another 10 percent, and then the cell to chassis design another 30 to 40 percent. Uh, if you would take uh, a current 500 kilometers battery uh, and you would uh, make all these improvements that I just mentioned, you would end up at 1100 kilometers. Yeah. Uh, the question is who really needs this? Yeah. Um, but uh, I think even Tesla mentioned now that they are probably not going to target this as an eternal goal uh, or the holy grail to reach 1,000 kilometers because most of the people won't need it. You will able, be able to buy cars with that. I mean, the current Mercedes can already drive 750 kilometers, uh, which is uh, a lot, I would say. And in one or two years, uh, you will find even cars with 1,000 kilometers. That they are pretty sure. Okay, so fast charging is also key. Amy, just how available is lithium? And what are the ecological implications of mining it, specifically when it comes to water use? Well, so, so lithium extraction happens in a number of ways, depending on where it is in on the earth and in what kind of ore body, but so there is some lithium that's extracted in similar ways that iron ore or other materials that are hard rock would be drawn out of the earth with your traditional digging, shoveling, blasting, removing topsoil and digging down for that ore and extracting it from the, from the main earth and rock and ore body that's there. Um, but there are also um, a lot of lithium that's being extracted using lithium brine extraction. So you've got liquid brine, which is a mixture of water and other chemical constituents that are sitting there on the surface. And so then it's more starting with um, just separating out the lithium from that brine extraction. Either way, you're dealing with um, significant issues and concerns around water. Um, these tend to be in places in the world where you've got dry environments, whether that's Nevada in the United States or China or Chile and Argentina and South America. Um, and you've got communities concerned with water quality and quantity um, there and the fragility of that environment. So whether you have a community talking about the concerns they have or a mining company responding to it, most frequently they are talking about water usage. And we're moving, of course, into a moment where as we look at renewable energy and the lithium connection with our renewable energy in this climate stress world, we also have to look at 
the fact that a climate stress world, the top of the supply chain for creating that renewable energy is these communities which are frequently dealing with either flooding in one part of a continent and droughts in another. And so this issue of, of what is going to be too much water taken feels critically important for those communities. Telling a community around the Salar in, in southern um, uh, Chile and Argentina, you know, this don't worry because this is going to renewable energy. That won't be answer enough for them because they say, but we need these fragile water resources for our self, self right here. So that's going to continue to be an issue bubbling up in the conflict between extraction and what the communities who live closest are looking at right now. Thank you. So, Max, if you could tell us about the price of battery packs, can we expect them to be much cheaper than they are now? Um, may I just add something to what Amy said? Um, I think it's it's also worth uh, to look at some numbers, uh, especially of the much criticized situation at the Salar region in Chile. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, interestingly, there have been protests uh, from from the, the people there uh, because uh, the, 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 the water levels were going down, but it's already in the 1990s. And this is because um, the big issue there at the Salar region is, interestingly, it's not the lithium. Uh, it is in the next valley. It's one of the biggest copper mines worldwide. And this consumes eight times more water than the entire lithium production. The lithium production, if you really look at the numbers, consumes as much water as the hotels around the uh, around the Salar. So, um, I mean, there is a consumption, and, and this uh, um, needs to be discussed. Um, but uh, we should also, uh, I mean, uh, make a comparison and put that in, into perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, but then your question was about the price of battery packs. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, that the battery packs, um, uh, that the prices will be going down. I think this is clear. Uh, and this is for several reasons. Uh, again, uh, it's a combination of engineering uh, and design. In the engineering, um, the, the cell to pack design allows uh, to reduce the number of parts by 40%. This is substantial. Yeah. That means the, the manufacturing costs, they will go down. And currently, a lot of efforts are going uh, on to uh, ban solvents uh, from, uh, from, from the, the battery manufacturing. Solvents so far are needed to, to make a paste, a slurry, uh, which is coated onto metal foils. And this is then the electrode. Yeah, and then these solvents need to be uh, evaporated and then recollected. It consumes a lot of energy. So the energy costs will go down. And then, um, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a shift in the materials. Um, uh, at the moment, the materials contain cobalt. Uh, so the, um, the target system at the moment of these high-performance systems is NMC811. It contains 80% nickel, 10% manganese, and 10% cobalt. However, um, uh, the, the first company which came up with a, a nickel and iron-free car was BYD in China last year. And this was possible due to a redesign. And in the new flagship of the model Han, um, they have uh, a new so-called blade battery, which uh, contains only lithium iron phosphate. Iron phosphate is a very abundant material, and this is non-toxic, it's cheap, and such a lithium iron phosphate uh, system is only 70% of the price of an N NMC-based battery, because the cathode costs uh, um, uh, take a lot of room in the entire cost calculation. And then there's a new development, and this is completely going away uh, from uh, lithium ion batteries. And this is the sodium ion battery. Uh, sodium ion batteries are not yet uh, competitive uh, in terms of, of range or so, but they are pretty close to the lithium iron phosphate systems. And they have some advantages. They, they uh, retain 90% of their capacity, even at minus 20 degrees. Uh, in, in NMCs retain only 70%. So you have no cold start issues. Um, and then 
the cost of such a sodium ion battery is projected to be only 40% of that what we have today. And this is this can be a game changer as well, I think. And uh, there's a uh, we are on this cost curve. Uh, this is constantly declining. Some big numbers that are being thrown around there. I like that. Um, in your view, Amy, what is the best way to approach the sheer amount of resources needed to transform battery-based mobility? Well, I, you know, I think Hans was sharing this at the beginning as well. I think it's going to be a multi-pronged approach of saying there are new materials that we're going to need or an increased amount of them. And then if, if we're extracting these materials so that we can have um, a future that has more renewable energy, then we're going to say we're going to do that extraction in a fundamentally uh, less harmful way at the top of the supply chain. We don't want to do harm at the top of the supply chain that is putting at risk the solution that we're trying to drive here with this. But I think it'll be more than just swapping materials. It'll be looking at uh, a greater amount of public transportation, shared transportation. It's going to be looking at um, the issues of, of distance and charge speed, as Max is talking about, um, and redistributing the ways that we can uh, both move ourselves from place to place and do that more equitably, but also look at how we can retrieve materials. I mean, there are, are many who will point out that these are materials that are viewed as, as non-renewable materials, unlike uh, agriculture or forestry or otherwise, and of course, but they could be far more renewable if we do a better job of capturing these and reusing them. So I think even looking at that, that reuse of the materials as we come out, which of course is increasing um, now, it, it didn't used to be the case with some like lithium, but there's a whole new uh, discussion of a, of a circular economy and of how we can put some of these materials back to use. Uh, Max, contemporary Amperex technology has just presented a sodium ion battery pack. What do you make of this? Yeah, this is uh, quite interesting. I mean, the, the sodium ion battery was actually commercialized a year before. Uh, by a British company, uh, Ferradion, but now um, this is, I would say, this can be a game changer that the world's largest battery manufacturer takes up this uh, technology. Um, from from the, the, the energy content, uh, at the moment they are at 160 watt hours per kilogram. Uh, lithium iron phosphate cells have 200, uh, but next year they want to catch up, so, so they, are, they are pretty close. Um, and they claim that you can pack them more densely into the battery pack, these cells, because they have less, less thermal issues. They, need, they don't need so much cooling, uh, so that eventually uh, the, the storage capacity of a battery pack uh, can catch up with LFP-based uh, uh, packs. And um, another thing, as I already mentioned, is that um, the, the, the battery is faster, uh, so that the, the, the sodium is softer, it can, can shuttle more easily and can, can, can be stored in the, uh, the materials much faster. Um, and this uh, gives this good cold start uh, abilities or, and, and the retention of the capacity at low temperatures. And also it allows fast charging. Uh, this is another advantage. So there, there's still a, a lag behind uh, the, the lithium ion battery, but I think uh, the technology will improve. Also the, the, uh, the durability must be improved. The cycle life is not comparable yet, but it's close, and um, I, I, I'm really looking forward of what, what's going to happen in, in, in this area. It's interesting that you bring up the idea of cold starts, because I come from a place where it's very, very cold in winter, sometimes <laughs> minus 50 degrees Celsius, and I remember we have to plug in our cars and hope that they would start all night long, or at university we had to run out in the parking lot, start it up, and then run back to our class. <laughs> Uh, Amy, <laughs> Amy, you've previously said that there is a wide chasm between how the mining industry perceives itself versus how activists see it. Tell us a bit more about that, please. Well, I think this is a case of um, 
uh, uncomfortable truths coexisting at the same time, where both of them indeed, though, are true. I mean, you have a mining industry who sees that they provide materials that most people in industrialized societies at least use every day. And that's true. Um, and I'd also further say um, to that that uh, even though we live in a world where increasingly people are understanding that they should know where their things come from, know where your food comes from, your water, your power, most people don't know where the mine materials come from that are in their phone or their car or the building or their jewelry. Um, and so I think you have a mining industry who is frustrated because they say, look, we provide these things that people are asking for that they use every day. And most people don't know much about where they come from and don't pay attention. Um, true. Uh, but you'll have community based activists and NGOs and others who say uh, yes. And um, the extraction of many of these materials First of all, non-renewable materials. So unlike agriculture, seafood, forestry, these are things that once we take them out, they're out. Um, and unless we start doing a better job of capturing them, we're using things up. Um, and then second, these are things where the extraction that we do right now leaves not only decades of impacts behind, but often uh, centuries or longer. So we may uh, have an extraction um, operation that may pull 12 years of materials out or even 40 years of materials. But if we are actively needing to manage the contamination at that site, whether it's mine waste or potential water quality risks for 400, 500, 600 years, well, then we certainly get to this critical question about what's the, the usage, what's our competing uses and priorities. And so I think both of these things are valid perspectives, but you're right in saying there's a chasm between them and how do we bring these things together with a greater appreciation for both sides. Uh, Max, you mentioned China earlier. What other countries are leading the way when it comes to battery research? And how can we get the nations that are lagging behind to catch up? I think there's a difference between battery research and battery production. Yeah. Um, certainly, China is, is leading the battery production at the moment. But Europe has invested um, three or four times more than China in, in the last three or four years. And we have uh, a map full of, of gigafactories that are under construction and uh, or are planned. So this is a, that there will be a, a huge step forward. Uh, from the research, it's actually quite interesting that uh, most of the materials that we are using today um, have been developed in the United States, although there is hardly any battery industry. Yeah? And uh, I think this will change uh, under the new administration. Uh, they have already uh, expressed interest to, uh, um, to, 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 to become stronger in that field. Uh, so that we will see, I would say, uh, an, a distribution all over the world. Uh, also, India is doing a lot of things. Um, they are planning their first gigafactories based on um, uh, a country, the developments from the country. Yeah. Um, so they, there's a lot of things going on. I would say that the map uh, is, is looking uh, uh, different at the moment, but uh, research-wise, it's... Um, it's already uh, everywhere and production-wise will also be equalized in a couple of years. Amy, when your standards are met with resistance by mining companies, is it safe to assume that that resistance is always linked to the bottom line or their profits? Oh, I don't think it's always linked to the bottom line, but I do think that the market does need to value greater environmental and social responsibility. Right now, the market of, of investors and purchasers of these materials for things that are made all the way down to the end brand car that we buy, phone, jewelry, et cetera. Um, you know, the greatest pressure on the mining sector has been getting the uh, ore out at the least price. So when we're talking about, yes, we want greater environmental and social responsibility, is price a factor for those who resist? Yes, it's a factor, but I don't think it's the only factor. I think there's also 
um, the standard that we have asks for a lot of transparency, for a lot more reporting on what are the environmental and social impacts of extraction. And I think the fact that a lot of this mining has happened far away from urban populations means that most people aren't aware of it. So even having a more frank discussion about how much impact and the type of impacts that happen on communities and the environment on which they depend um, is is uncomfortable right now in this sector. Um, so, But I think we need to have a lot more honest conversation about these are materials that many of us are using every day. They come with an impact. Let's know what that impact is, um, understand it, and then create value in a market for the industry to, um, to not only innovate. I think a lot of the innovation is already there. It's just a question of will the value of that come back financially if, an, if a mining company puts that effort and investment in. And I hope this market is saying, yes, we do value that. Yeah, out of sight, out of mind, definitely for the most consumers. Uh, Max, some experts predict that it could be five to ten years before solid-state batteries are on the market. But will the market be willing to wait that long? That's a good question because, uh, I mean, the improvements uh, that are expected from the uh, um, solid state battery are on the one hand safety, yeah, uh, but also they claim that it might be produced at lower costs, but this needs still to be demonstrated. Um, still, there are no uh, um, uh, products on the market and it's unclear um, when they will show up. Uh, some companies uh, are claiming that they will come out next year with that, uh, but we we still have to see. Uh, and even if if the if the battery uh, is is coming, uh, then it needs to be integrated in a car, and this has a, a lead time, which is also at least I would say two or three years typically, yeah, before it it can be just taken over and integrated in a car. So I wouldn't expect that before 2025. And in the meantime, uh, I mean, we have been talking about the improvements that are made uh, with the uh, conventional lithium-ion battery. Um, uh, in the meantime, it might happen that these goals uh, that are targeted by the solid-state battery have already been reached uh, by, by the conventional technology. So this is a, uh, an interesting uh, situation. Yeah. Uh, Amy, I'd like to know, what is the biggest change that you would like to see in the mining of minerals? Well, I'd love to see uh, all of this exciting talk about circular economy that's really looking at how do we keep putting back into use what we've taken out. Um, there are some material supply chains that already do this. Um, you, no one's putting their gold out in the recycling bin at the curb, right? Um, and you know, the steel sector has been doing a pretty good job of materials retrieval, copper as well, but I think we could be doing a lot more of it so that we begin to look at um, how do mining companies not only be new extraction companies, but be companies that are taking these materials and putting them back to work. Um, and then I think that issue of transparency too, how do we have a really authentic, I think increasingly around the world, we do have a better understanding about the food we eat. What impact does that have on the places where we farm it or, um, or, or the climate connections to that? Can we have that consciousness around the materials that we use that are dug out of the earth and then use that consciousness to change the way that we extract them? Max, what would you say is the biggest challenge facing your industry? I would say um, this is uh, cost and precision. Yeah. Um, cost is the, the main driver uh, for the introduction of the, um, the batteries into the market. Um, there has been an, a lot uh, in the past, so the costs declined by 90%. Uh, but this needs to um, go on further. Um, and uh, with that, we will be able in one or two years uh, to offer cars which are uh, not more, any more expensive compared to, to combustion engine driven cars. Um, and, and then the precision is, is necessary because uh, this impacts, especially w with the new designs where you have large cells, this impacts uh, the safety and it impacts the 
um, the uh, durability, so the cycle life. Um, the, there, everything must be manufactured very, very precisely um, to get a safe and long-lasting battery. Uh, Amy, if you could, where do you see the mining industry in five years from now? Wow, I definitely see the mining industry in a space which has come much closer to uh, others, you know, in that I've talked about, you know, our sense around food, our sense around power. I think that mining has just been so far away from the end consumer. When we think about the things that we use that start in mines, most people know the name of the brands um, that they wear for jewelry, or they may know that for their car or their phone, but they don't know those names all the way back to where materials are produced. So I think pulling that out into the light um, so that it's not literally underground and in the dark, but much more brought out and, and that there's value given to those who are trying to do this in such a way that minimizes harm to the environment and find and that they find an economic return for that. I think that that's where we're going to be going to and not resisting it. So, And Max, if you could very briefly, where do you see the battery industry five years from now? I see myself surrounded by uh, gigafactories. <laughs> so I would say that, that, that it, it will be, it will grow tremendously. Uh, not only because of the cars, also we we have 40% increase in the stationary sector, so this will grow and grow and grow. Okay, Max and Amy, thank you very much for joining us on this first day of Shift Mobility. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Nice to join you, Max, too.